Stage with Robert Emery. Hello and welcome to episode number 10 of Backstage with me, Robert Emery. Today I'm interviewing the British stage, TV and film actor Peter Polycarpu. Polly is probably best known for his work playing Chris Theodopolopoulos in Birds of a Feather, but he's since had a career that surpasses being a TV personality. He was the first actor to play the role of John in the original production of Miss Saigon. He was in the original cast of Les Mis. He played Phantom. Uh, he's even danced opposite Madonna in the Evita film. He starred opposite Sean Bean and Charlotte Rampling in the film Clean Skin, and most recently, he starred opposite Kelsey Grammer in Man of La Mancha. In this episode, we dive into what made him become an actor, what his five golden tips are to give yourself the best shot at success in any field of work, and new for this episode, a set of quick fire questions where we find out the answer to the most important question of all, Les Mis or Miss Saigon. So here we go, behind the scenes with Peter Polycarpu. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hey, it's great to be here, Robert. No, well, thank you for, for coming on. So um, just so everybody knows, I think we first met really quite a long time. Well, it feels like a long time ago now um, when you were doing an evening with Peter Polycarpu at the Garrick, the Garrick yeah. Theatre. Yeah. And that was a sort of a, a compilation of stuff which has affected you over over the years. Yeah, um, the Songs of My Life, I think we called it, didn't we? Yes. And uh, it was lovely Jean that, that found you for me, um, and I'm so pleased that she did. Yeah, it was... Uh, Jean is your agent. My agent, yes. Yeah. And um, it was one of those things where we, we together really put the material together, and you did some wonderful arrangements, and uh, we had a couple of choirs, and there were lots of people involved, guests of mine that came and sang, and it was at the Garrick Theatre, and it was a huge... Great fun and a huge success. So it, it was, and and then it. and then we went on and and did a, a couple of projects together, um, which is the music of Randy Newman. Yeah, yeah. Um, laugh and be happy. Laugh yeah. and be happy. That's something I devised myself and compiled, put the material together, and uh, found. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a great, great fan of his music. I think he he writes beautifully for actors as well. Because he says of himself, he says, I write in the third person. He's, he's writing for characters. He's not really in, you know, he's not one of those who writes love stories or, or love songs particularly. As he writes about events. And I think that's what fascinates me about his writing. And also his writing is so plaintive. He comes from a huge dynasty, you know this, but mm. um, of of great film music writers. There's three uncles of his who have written for, for, uh, film scores for some of the you know, most iconic movies of the last, uh, you know, 50 years. Anyway, that said... Uh, we did that didn't we in Chichester we did and um, again I've used and done that several times because I've used the material with different artists and ha have invited people like Clive Rowe um, and lots of different people to sing the material Tyrone Hunt uh, Huntley was yeah. uh, one of my early uh, discoveries well when I say discoveries he just came in and sang for me I just knew instantly that I wanted to use him in something and uh, Hannah Waddingham and uh, people like that uh, have come and sung it in the past uh, Beverly Klein um, uh, Claire, I think Claire Moore did our Garrick show, didn't she? She, she did, yeah. So l I've used lots of people that I've worked with over the over the years, mind their talents. Yeah, and talk about over the years. Do you have a memory of when you first decided, hey, I I, I want to be an actor? It's one of the things I want to do with my life. I think it was when I found that I could combine singing with acting that I realised that that's what I wanted to do with my life, because previous to. Um, becoming uh, or going to drama college I'd always sung and I, I was um, playing the piano at a very early age teaching myself I played by ear I'm not a great reader of music as you know I'm mean, I read chord charts but uh, that's about it and I realized that when I was on stage singing a song in a character that that is where I lived my life that is how I was fully myself so it started at the unicorn theater for children when I got this part in um a then it was called well in those days it was it was a rock opera actually, Sadko and the Fish with Fins of Gold. It was based on a Russian uh, opera uh, of the, the same name I think Sadko, and um, that was my very first job um, singing and acting, and it was a wonderful part. This this minstrel who sang to the the, the spirit of the river, 
and um, fell in love with uh, the woman who kind of came up from the sea and whose whose father Poseidon didn't want her to marry this young minstrel. It's a lovely story. Sounds anyway. epic. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and, and and when you were a youngster, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a teenager, were, were you always a performer? You know, were you one of these kids at school who could get away with anything because you were you know constantly performing and using comedy and and you know it, it was that sort of part of your growing up it's an element of that i think i was always a bit of a joker okay um i used were you a naughty to, boy at school yes very much so i yeah, mean okay. the, the teachers used to say of me that i had ants in my pants <laughs> so, and that i would never be you know uh, still for a moment and i was constantly um you know inventing stuff to do uh, in, during lessons and um, I think they moved me up and moved me down and they didn't know where to put me uh, but I do remember being in school productions I, I sang Mabel in the Pirates of Penzance in one school production and uh, funny enough I had that in common with my wife uh, so we both played Mabel <laughs> which is quite fun um, and I do remember playing the Cowardly Lion in the Wizard of Oz at a very young age and my mum made my tail for me out of uh, old tights you know that was cool. lovely and um, so that I, I would have been no more than nine or ten then. So and did I got you, the bug Did you grow up young. in 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 the UK? Or yeah. Were, you, were yeah. you born? No, we were born in Brighton. My sister and I were born in Brighton, okay. and we had quite a. Um, it, it it's quite a, an interesting childhood in the sense that it, it it kind of forged a very close relationship that I have with my sister. We were we were in a convent together when we were very young um i was there from the age of about a year and my sister similarly was there and she's slightly older than me so she was there earlier than i was and we spent nearly four and a half five years in this convent being run by nuns because both my parents worked um and my mum had my sister uh, before she was married and in, and, and in brighton which were, were both born um in, in those days there was a small greek community there and my mum was rather, you know, you know, shunned by the Greek community because she'd had child out of wedlock and uh, very orthodox in those days. Um, and so they kind of put us in the convent, A, to um, keep the children kind of out of, you know, the, out of people's way and um, out of sight is out of mind, I suppose. And also to save money because they both worked. My mum at that time was taking in sewing. She was a seamstress. My father was a waiter. And they both worked, and in that sh that that space of four years or so, they saved money. And then we, as a family, we moved to London. And then my brother was born um, uh, eight years after I was born, and so I would have been. Um, we were we were as a family were then living in London when my brother was born. So um, yeah, it. it was a childhood I suppose that, that I still I still remember I, and I can I can still remember the smell of that convent and the, the you know the varnish on the floor and the, and I can still remember the nuns and um, I, I don't remember anything particularly bad happening uh, to me um, but I did have a recurring nightmare um, until I was about 13 14 uh, being taken to the incinerator and being called, uh, you know, the devil Ooh. and being burned, you know, Ooh, being, and like waking up just before I got thrown into the fire, you Ooh. know, it was that sort of thing. Wow. So, um, yeah, because I think they used to say something like, you're a little devil, you know, you're mm. a little devil. And, and uh, uh, so I do remember that uh, quite distinctly, but I'm glad that, that, you know, that dream stopped because it's something that, that uh, I suppose stayed with me for many years after that. Mm. And was it the school productions that you did, you know, things like The Wizard of Oz? And was it that which sort of really sparked your your interest in the entertainment business? Um, yes, and um, there were other things that, that, that interested me about it. I, I've, I, when my sister and I were quite young also, my parents used to take us to loads of Greek weddings. Lots of Greeks would get married in London in those days. And um, we learnt some Greek folk tunes and my mother and father put us on a, on a table literally in the middle of the wedding and said come on have a sing and we would sing these folk tunes to the to, you know to the guests at the wedding oh. and I, so, so, and that was I, again we would have been no more than about seven or eight at that, that time so uh, it started from having a, an interest in singing I love to sing and I love to sing with my sister so performing in that way 
Um, and then I suppose putting on a costume, putting on a dress, putting on a bit of lippy uh, as Mabel really did, did, it excited me in a way that I don't think I'd been excited before. So from that point of view and listening to the audience applaud and just being out in front of an audience, getting that adrenaline surge. I remember that and I remember the lights and I remember the stage. Yeah. yeah. So you went to college um, and did a degree, I assume? Well, it was a diploma sort of in those diploma. days. It was called a London University Diploma in Dramatic Arts, and it was part of uh, what is now Middlesex University. And in those days, it was Polytechnic. Hmm. But I didn't stay. I, I only lasted a year. Oh, really? There is a, st- I mean, there is a, a, a reason for that. I, 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 I couldn't get a grant. And whilst I was at drama college, I was playing in different bands in the evening. I was working as well to try and, you know, try and afford the fees. And I couldn't afford the fees in the, in the end. And then this band that I was in uh, got signed up by a couple of producers. And uh, I left drama college to pursue a career as a professional muse- musician. And um, after, I would say, various attempts to, uh, you know, uh, failed attempts at being a rock god... Um, I ended up um, being offered this part that I talked about earlier of Sadco uh, by a a musician that I'd been in a band with. And that's how it started for me, 1979. That was my first year in the business. Um, And so I'd left drama college to become a professional musician. And then within three years after leaving and being in various bands, this guy, Hugh Trithowen, said to me, Polly, do you want to come and... Um, auditioned for this part and in those days you needed an equity card to work and that's how I got my, my first job Aha uh-huh. Now one of the, the things that must have changed your life to, to some extent and really put you on a sort of a, a national stage of course was Birds of a Feather Now I, I don't need to talk an awful lot about that because that was a very long time ago but how did that affect you ongoing how has that changed your life or maybe it hasn't but you know you're a household name now um, people recognise you. Do you think it's directly because of that? Well, I think there are some elements um, of, of you know, people recognising me from Birds of I still get that today. Um, but there's very little crossover between the people that know me in the theatre and the people that know me from Birds of a Feather. It, it seems um, they are kind of two separate... They feel like, and I have done over the years, like two separate audiences. But what Birds of a Feather did do is, um, on an occasion, it actually precluded me from doing some work because I remember a director said to me, I can't have you in this because you're too well-known on the telly for that. Uh-huh. You know, and literally it stopped me from working. But in other respects, it's opened doors for me. So it, it has been and continues to be, uh, an, you know, a, a kind of influence on my life because uh, people have, um, you know, people still remember it. Mm. Uh, and it was my first first major television role. Yeah. You know. but, but And since Birds of a Feather, though, you seem to have sort of diverted slightly more into theatre than TV. Was that a, a conscious decision you wanted to make at the time or is that just how... The cookie crumbles. Yeah, it is the way the cookie crumbles. I've done a lot of um, television and I've done some film over the years, um, but theatre has been my first love, I think. And I spent more or less the first 10 years of my life uh, as an actor um, in various you know, theatre companies like the York Theatre Royal or Worthing Connaught Theatre or um, Leeds um, or Nottingham Playhouse. And in those places, I would do... Um, you know, rep. And you don't really get that as much these days. And that was kind of my training as an actor. And so having come from that that theatre background for the first 10 years, it kind of stood me in very good stead for later on because I still get people who, um, you know, I think work does breed work. So the more you have worked, people do remember you, or, you know, in my case, they have. And they've kind of said to, oh, you know, I work with people at Carpa, and this is something I found out years later, and or that they've seen you in something, and then, then they'll ask you to come and audition because they've seen you in something, or, or someone has recommended them, you know, you to them. So, but the theatre's, um, yeah, has always been very important in my life, mm. and continues to be, you know. Uh, so I, in... In doing research for, for our chat today, um, I have to be honest with you. I'm, I mean, I knew you'd done an awful lot, and I kind of guess I knew most of this already. It's just reading it on one page is, is quite astonishing. You were the first actor to play the role of John in Miss Saigon when that launched in London. Um, I didn't know that uh, you played Phantom. Yeah, I was the first uh, Cypriot Phantom, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, I didn't know you were in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as the child catcher. Um, I came to see you uh, doing Sweeney, 
Sweeney Todd. Yeah. I came to see you at the at the Collie, was it? Uh, we were Where at the Adelphi. Was it? At the Adelphi, that was it. Um, I didn't know you were in Mrs. Henderson Presents, which you were in Toronto in that. That's right, yeah. And, Funny enough, and, my sister was there more or less at the same time doing um, Strictly Ballroom before yeah. it uh, morphed into the wonderful success that it was. It was a you, different show. You were show. there just a little bit before... Um, I was there actually with, with Bad Out of Hell. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, I, yeah. we went over to Ed Mervish, yeah. and I think you were in the the other theatre, which yeah, is Alexandria. Close, yeah, and that's the, the close one to the apartments where yes. I guess we probably stayed in the same. And then I think it's probably the Princess of Wales, which is the one yeah. that my sister was in. Uh, yes, yeah. in the same apartment block, which is literally two minutes away. It is with a Starbucks at the bottom, which is great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so many great eateries and lovely little jazz venues in in, in Toronto, which I really liked. Yeah. Um, and places where you could eat very late at night, and obviously, you know, with being in the theatre, that is, you know, more or less because you know you live at night, really. Yeah, and I mean, Tor- Toronto is amazing. But sorry, yeah, I, I, I loved it. I diverge. Um, I didn't know you were in Evita, the film with with Madonna. Dance with Madonna, um, actually. Yes. Yeah, so, I, <laughs> to, uh, talking about this, I, I found online yeah. um, a sort of a diary entry oh, thing yeah, yeah. that you did, yeah. and I just want to read a bit of it because I, this is very amusing. You said <laughs> I did it for the time. Yeah. You said I also had a dance rehearsal with Madonna's choreographer, so I could learn the box steps I'll be doing with Lady M at the ball. This is not something I want to think about too much because she's a very good dancer and I'm not. It had gone well, and I went back to my trailer, not thinking we'd be called again. After I'd been uh, on my back for a few Zs, I got a call that Madonna wanted to do a bit of off-camera with me to help Andonian Baron Banderas' sideline during his bit of the same song. I dutifully went along. However, it was a lot more difficult for me to do, and she got impatient because I was unsure of the new steps. It was a bit of a baptism of fire, but though she was sharp with me, it didn't matter. For me, being in the film has been like being told you're good enough for the big league. Although Madonna is a great ship which has passed very closely without making any real contact. Not ships that pass in the night, but a great ship passing a windsurfer on the open sea. Still, the premiere of the most talked about movie of the year looms, and I'm in it. Eat your heart out, Theodopolopidus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember. Well, I remember some of that. I don't remember all yeah, of that. Not and, bad, I suppose. Uh, well, do you know what, 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 what's interesting is that with your resume and with your career and you've done some really huge work over the time and some very important work you know if you went to any kid now at at um at, at i was gonna say at music college but at, at drama college you want to go into musical theater and they look at your resume you know they're going to be amazed by that and what i find interesting about that little um diary entry from you is that it's quite obvious that you are not necessarily in awe of Madonna. That would be the wrong word, but and starstruck wouldn't necessarily be the right word either. But you certainly, maybe a bit intimidated actually by by her and her status. I was and at the time, yeah. And I find that a really interesting thing and a, a healthy thing that somebody with the resume that you've got, with with the the experience that you've got, um, can still be in, uh, intimidated by somebody like Madonna. Um, I think that's really an interesting thing about your your psyche, and and does that continue today? I mean, you've just been on stage with Kelsey Grammer at the ENO, and you know he's a big star, and you know there's so many big stars you've worked with over the years, and you are you know, a star in yourself, but you know obviously compared to Madonna, um, a worldwide megastar. I mean, do you still do you still get nervous about working with? Yes, people I do. Like that? I, I think what I have is a healthy level of insecurity, and I do um, not. Uh, I, I know my craft, I think, or I know I know more about my craft now, and so I'm more confident about what I do, and I'm more confident about social situations and meeting new people and new, meeting people who are in themselves, you know, are very established in their own careers. Um, but I still, um, yeah, I still get a little bit wary of throwing my weight around or or of um, choices that I make um, in a performance, and I have to get to know someone really well for in order. Um, for a performance or a, um, a role to work, you have to really work in an intimate way, and and sometimes I think a level of um, trust needs to be achieved for you to do that. And so it's always good to be vulnerable. I think um, you have to you have to be open in that sense. So that's where it comes from. I think mm-hmm. is that that that. that 
ego shouldn't take over. I think your ego should kind of go out the door, um, uh, you know, when you're working with people, and so that you just you try and try to be as 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 natural as you can be. And I think that's because on a human level, you need to make contact with people um, in order for that that ice to break or for that 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 difficult part of the, the the rehearsal process to get to be got through or text that you really need to investigate you, you you have to open yourself up for that so yeah i mean what you've just said there is is sage advice it's that's that's a golden ticket which if anybody who's listening to this wants to work in theater the phrase leave your ego at the door is such a, a credible piece of advice. I mean, I know from my side, from conducting a show, when I have to deal with, with egos, you know, it gets mm. boring very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you have to manage that. And it's it's a waste of energy for everybody. And people um, won't want to work with you. Yeah. Uh, they, they're they not really interested. Yes, you can be fantastic. And if two people who are you know, equally talented and um, brilliant at what they do come and, and, and uh, are presented to a director or a casting director for the same role... And one of them's got a big ego, and the other one hasn't. I can I can almost you know guarantee that the one that hasn't got the ego, or the chip on their shoulder, or the you know that needs the uh, uh, all of the the extra um, kind of work on the contract, mm. <laughs> is 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 going to be the one that gets the job. Mm. Mm. Just the way it is, mm. you know. Now going back to Miss Saigon, um, you know we 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 both know Claude Michel Schoenberg. Who is the composer of that? We are. I'm very proud to say he's a mate of mine. Yeah, so. and um, I mean he's a, a an astonishing composer. Um, I guess you must have met Claude Michel while you were doing Miss Saigon. I guess you probably didn't meet him before that. I did. You did because I did Les Mis, and um, I'm, I met Claude Michel um, during the rehearsal process uh, on Les Mis. I didn't know him socially then, and I only got to know him socially during Saigon, and then after Saigon um, when it just so happens that my wife Maddie and his wife Charlotte uh, went to school together oh really so quite independently of each other they knew each other and um, uh, we were introduced again socially after many years of working Saigon and then we realised that there was this uh, relationship so it's fantastic when you got married to Charlotte uh, it was a delight for, for all four of us you know mm. and we have got to know each other really well since uh, since they were married but um, and, and establish a closer relationship uh, over the last few years and I looked to him especially recently for uh, for his words of advice and encouragement or hopefully um, you know pointing me in the right direction where something that I'm supposed you know developing um, has um, he came to see recently at the Royal Academy of Music something that I've I've been writing for the last three and three and a bit years and uh, was very helpful with his advice. So. Yeah, I mean he's a very kind kind bloke. Um, tell me about Saigon and and yeah. of course that the big song in that for you is Bui Doi. Yeah, um, actually it's a very difficult song to sing. That it's not not an easy um, piece of music to perform. Well, I remember I was at the Royal Shakespeare uh, Company at the time when I got the the, the call for the audition. And I had the music. It was faxed over. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's how long ago it was, yeah. And um, one of the... Um, it was, I think, a guy called Stuart Brown, who was the musical director then at the RSC, taught me the song because he had some time and uh, he took me to one side. And um, I remember it was in E. And... Um, uh, no, sorry, it was in A. a. It was in that's A. Right, I beg your pardon. Top a. Yeah, yeah, it was in A. And... Um, the top note was actually a B natural. And I said, well, uh, the eight shows of this a week is going to be absolutely impossible. It was just at the t- right at the tip of my range and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to, see it, to sing it. Anyway, I learned it and I sang it. And I remember going on stage at the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane. I did one audition and Nick Heitner was with Cameron and I remember Claude Michel Schermbo coming up onto the stage after I'd sung the song and giving me the most huge hug, which I thought, oh, I think I've done rather well here. Right. <laughs> and and I remember Nick Heitner's turning to Cameron and you know, saying, yeah, that sits really well in your voice, doesn't it? But and when we got, started to rehearse the thing, I realised that, you know, singing this, this, as you say, it's a huge, huge thing mm. for any actor, um, that it was going to take it out of me if I was going to sing this eight shows a week. Mm. So I asked him if he could take it down half a tone and he very graciously agreed to it. Um, and I think that it stood me in very good stead because that has then made it absolutely perfect for me to be able to sing 
eight shows a week in because mm. I, you ask an opera, an opera singer to sing something which is you know at the edge of their range or in, in a hard part of their voice they won't be asked to sing that role more than three or four times a week mm. you know whereas in musical theatre you have to have oh, no. lungs of leather oh, no. uh, sorry folds of leather yeah. and um, yeah so I absolutely enjoyed doing it um, playing the role I made some great friends I got to know Jonathan Price really well he was a lovely man and uh, we used to travel home together quite a lot because we lived that, quite close to each other And there's, there's an old VHS video which I guess I've still got somewhere which is the making of Miss Saigon yeah, the and, I, and I have I remember the it. document I haven't yeah. seen it in Donkey's years and I never clicked that you were yeah. in that of yeah. course um, I'm in that there's a very brief clip of me getting a bit tetchy because I hadn't had my mic on it was almost beginners and I was getting a bit worried because it was heading to the beginning of the performance but I must tell you this little story about Saigon because um, I was I'd been in it about a year a year or so and I never really stay in a show longer than about a year yeah. that's my limit and anyway I, I, and I come to the end of the, the, the my time there and I was, it was one of the last performances anyway um, I'm sorry about my um, my that's all right. uh, notifications going on there anyway um, so I used to have uh, regular chats with the stage manager in the interval. And I'd think nothing that, you know, standing there, uh, getting changed and being in my underpants and talking to her whilst the, you know, the interval was going. Uh, Jane Sulberg, her name was, uh, is. And she became a, quite a famous casting director and works at uh, Regent's Park Open Air Theatre and does a lot of casting. But she was a stage manager in those days. And we'd have these regular chats and we'd, uh, you know, uh, pass time of day and talk about anything and everything. And... As I said, it was one of my last performances. And as we were talking, I got so carried away that suddenly I heard um, over the tannoy the overture of the song. Now, as oh, you know, no. Bui Doi yes. is the first song. And there is a, quite a short entrée to the beginning yes. of the show, second, second half of the show. Oh. So I was absolutely um, worried and, and kind of uh, 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 screaming, oh, my God, I should be on stage. And so I literally grabbed my clothes and started dressing um, as I was... Have you heard the story or not? No. Okay. <laughs> dressing as you were running down the corridor. Literally dressing as I was running down the corridor. And as I got oh. down, to, down the corridor, I realised that the iron was still in, the iron curtain huh? was still in, and the whole of the cast <laughs> were on <laughs> the <a> stage. <laughs> and, yeah, and Jane had recorded the overture and put it over the tannoy <laughs> to be played at you know, three or four minutes before I was due to go on, and they got me, and it was brilliant, That's because the whole, the whole of the rest of the cast were gathered on stage waiting for That's me, fantastic. seeing me in a state of undress, and it was very, very funny. So I remember that. That's, but I also, that's great. Yeah, it's a lovely story. But I remember the the the, uh, the friends that I made on that production. I still know today. Simon Bowman, for instance, yeah. and uh, Claire Moore. And yeah. uh, I don't see as much uh, of Claire as these days, but um, less longer. And uh, Jonathan. So it was a very special time. And Nick Holder, lovely Nick Holder. Nick Holder. I mean, when we did Bad Out of Hell in Manchester, yeah, the stage manager pulled the same trick ah. on the band. Except the ironic thing is, we were all in the band room just talking yeah. in the interval. Yeah. And it was April Fool's Day, so they, they did it as an April Fool's for the whole cast. Nobody knew. Um, and five minutes, you know, before curtain up, after after the interval, they played um, the opening sort of 20 seconds of, of uh, whatever opened um, Act Two. And of course, we were in the band room. The rest of us were there. All of the band were there. None of us looked at each other and went, well, that's not possible, is it? Because we were all sitting here. We all jumped up, ran as fast right. as we could to the pit to Even realise... Oh, no. Fools. What did we? you think they'd done? <laughs> yes. And uh, it's I like never, Pavlov's dogs, isn't it? I know, really, I I've never forgotten that. Okay, I mean, so, so that was a, 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 a real um, highlight of your career. I mean, there must have been a highlight of your career doing um, Saigon. Phantom's an interesting one because... Phantom is that role where if you speak to somebody who is not in the profession, they go, oh my God, you play Phantom of the Opera, that's amazing. But actually, Phantom is a really small part in, it is. in the She's show. She's only on stage for about 11 minutes, I think, in total. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and it wasn't a happy experience for me. I can no. talk about it now, in all honesty. I didn't uh, fit the role. Yeah. Uh, it didn't suit me vocally. And uh, Lloyd Webber didn't think I was particularly good in the role. Did you think you were good in the role? Uh, I thought I was all right. And mm. I still get people coming up to me saying, I saw you as the Phantom of the Opera. And uh, being nice about it, but um, no, it probably wasn't my um, you know best 
part mm. and I think I probably had a bit of an ego then as well and I think it kind of it was very helpful in the sense that it taught me that um, you know things can be given to you just as easily as they can be taken away from oh, you yeah, sure. and he gave me the elbow basically he sacked me and so I'm, I'm, I'm one of a very few select people you That's know been who have, by like Patty Lapone yeah. and uh, was yeah. it uh, um, Glenn Close wasn't it that was sacked was she it? was yeah so um, I'm happy to be in that club uh, but it actually <laughs> taught me it taught me a, a good you know a good lesson I think um, you, you also played the, the leading role in, a, in a, a show that I didn't see I know the soundtrack and I like the music very well but it didn't do very well and that's Imagine This oh right um, yeah Imagine This a lovely show yeah I mean the, the soundtrack is lovely um, you know I've, I've, I've listened to it relatively regularly yeah um, was that just bad timing in theatre it was, it was just bad time to get a new show up and running if anything was destroyed by the uh, publicity and um, pre-publicity of a show it was Imagine This um, they had done extensive work to try and, and and figure out how people that survived the Holocaust would, would take and understand the piece as a piece of theatre. And they had tried, um, I think, to gauge the response of how people would feel about it in, in quite a detailed way. And I think that they felt that it was uh, a credible piece of theatre. I think some of the writing of the book was flawed. And we would rehearse and I would ask for different, you know, versions of something. And I would, you know, say that this wasn't right. And because I was playing the leading role in it and um, and, and I, it would come back and it still wasn't right. But uh, uh, they were, you know, working very, very hard. And David Goldsmith, the librettist, was fantastic to work with. And Shuki Levy was wonderful to work with. And Glenn Berenboim, bless his heart, um, Berenheim uh, was, was trying and trying to make this thing work. But I, I think... The book was what suffered very badly um, during the um, the rehearsal process, and it didn't really, for me, um, you know, work properly in the same way that the music did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the two, you know, the combination of turning the story within that that kind of ghetto situation, um, and then having a story um, within the story. It was a lovely idea, but it, the writing, I don't think, was of sufficient quality to make it work. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't have a, a show without a phenomenal book. Yeah, it, it just, and the book just didn't really you know. gel together in that way. I love the music, and I, like you, I still... Um, you and know, lovely set to design as well. Yeah, and I thought that worked very well. And um, Tim Sheeder, the director, I think, did a phenomenal job of it. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. It's such a shame, but hey, things are meant to be. Um... I want to talk to you about accents. Yeah. Because I, I watched your show reel last night. It made me laugh a lot. I love the comedy in... Um, threesome? A threesome. <laughs> That's really great. It right? is a very funny show. Um, but I, I watched this, this show reel, which you've got threesome, the lost honour of Christopher Jeffries, Hustle, Lehman Brothers, Clear Skin, and Tyrant. And you're all doing different accents. Um, and you, you've got a real talent for, for accents. Um, is that something which you had training on, or is just it's you've been able to do that? It's developed um, over the years. I've got a good ear um, musically, so I, I I'm quite attuned to the way people speak, yeah. and I'm very I'm always fascinated by um, how people speak and and and, and syntax particularly, mm. and so the way that people construct um, you know sentences uh, when they're not speaking a language which is their own. Uh, is something that you can pick up on and, and it's very helpful. For, it has been helpful for me as, a, as an actor. So um, when, you need to, when you need to do a, a certain accent, how do you get to the point where you're happy with it? I listen to a lot of people um, speaking in that accent. I do go away and do quite a lot of research before I actually attempt to do it myself. And then I, I try and that mimic it in some way, mimic the inflections, mimic the rise and the fall and the, and the, and the way that, the, the, as I say, the, the sentences are constructed. I try and improvise around what I'm hearing and I'll speak along, um, along with it so that I, I try and get a feeling for the person I mean, when, you, when you're making a cup of tea in the house and you're talking to... To Maddie and I mean, do you yeah. carry on 
in I do that accent. I do. I've done it. Oh, I've done it in the past, definitely. I've sp- I've spoken like you know a whole day trying to perfect an accent and, and talking in a particular way. And and I've done quite a lot of Arabic parts, and um, you know, and again, quite a lot of American parts. And there is there are subtle differences in the American accent, and trying to tr- just trying to be really, really on point with it, and um, make it as as precise as you can be. I think if you as an artist, I think one of my bits of advice would be to strive for the very best that you can be. And that means going beyond what you think is, um, you know, a, 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 I think you should you should challenge yourself to the point where you're actually scared. So that you, you, you've you got to, I think when you take on work, there ought to be an element of fear in some of the, can I, can I really do this? And there ought to be an element of, of um Am I, you know, there ought to be a question the whole way through of is this the right approach? Am I getting this right? Do I, what should I do here? Is there, is there something else I could do? Choices that you make are really terribly important as an actor. And I think sometimes that we get too easily um, satisfied with what we do. And I think you have to be your own worst critic mm. or best critic I don't know whether that's, that makes sense but you have to be someone that, that really I think uh, analyses and can, continues to analyse a performance all the way through a, a run never ever be too set in what you do always be willing to challenge yourself and to try and do something in, in a different way now I know some actors will say well I've only got one line you know I've only got um, you know a tiny bit to do in this how can I do that and I think there is a there, there, there's something in that that that, that you have to approach, I think, your work in a way that that is going to, um, if it doesn't, if it no longer motivates you, if it no longer interests you, if you're getting bored in what you're do, you're doing, um, that's the time to really go and do something else. Mm. You know, uh, uh, try something else because there are so many people out there um, competing for what you're doing and competing to be in the in the job. Yeah, that you've and got. have a hunger for it. Yeah. Yeah, not only hunger for it, but can be probably do it just as well, if not better than you. Mm. You know, mm, I know. And talking about doing other things, everybody knows you as an actor, and one of the reasons why you're here today, apart from to talk with me, is because you've written a musical. So you're a composer as well. Well, I don't know what I've written yet. I'm not sure it's a musical yet. I'm not sure what it is, to be honest. It's a bit of a hybrid, but uh, I've written something which is based on my own experience. I've used my musical ability what for, for you know, for whatever reason. It, and I'm, I'm not sure what musical ability I've got, but I um, have written this thing from my heart and uh, it's something that has come from my own experience and I, I'm hoping to develop it. I think there are elements of it which I'm, you know, I think are interesting. There are other elements that um, that when Claude Michel Sherbert came to see it, for instance, at the Royal Academy of Music, um, he pointed out that he said one of the criticisms that he had of, he had of it and me in my writing was that he said uh, something like, um, you know, you you cut off the branch on which you are sitting, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is an interesting uh, criticism. So there is, I think, more work to be done on it. Yes, I've written it. Yes, I'm passionate about it. I still believe in it as a piece. I want to develop it further. But it's been going for about three years. And I know that any musical takes between a germination period of about five to seven years. So it's still got a way to go. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I was there at the, the, the performance, the workshop performance with Klumasha. And I remember one of my sort of overall criticisms of the piece and one of the things that you know i'd like to work on with you is that you've you've got what i suppose one would call new composer syndrome and i was doing an interview with a film composer last night actually for this for this podcast he'll be the guest um and on the episode after this and uh one of the things he was saying is that the first film he wrote he's very proud of it um but he goes back and listens to it and he's also quite ashamed of it because he said he you know he was so excited by this he he wanted to throw in every style of music that he could think of because it's it's this new thing and he wanted to show the world what he could do so he wanted to throw everything in there and i think one of the interesting things about about your piece is it's it's got a slight similarity to that which is it's it's very innovative it's got a really really some beautiful moments in there musically 
but I can tell that you are still trying to find your feet, find your sound, find you as a, as a composer, which, you know, you've done as an actor. Um, but what made you want to, to write music? I mean, that's such a different skill from, from being an actor. I mean, I, you know, I could never be an actor. It's just not within me, I don't think. So, um, you know, and essentially that is the same, you know, I'm a musician trying to be an actor. I mean, I'm not saying you're trying to be a composer and you want to be the next Club Michelle Schoenberg, but nevertheless, you've done this and you must want to do it. So what made you want to go, okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to pause my acting for a second and I'm going to spend three years doing this. Or yeah, I, I think it's a fair criticism you make as well <clears throat> about having to want to, you know, wanting to show, um, you know, put too much in and show what I can do. And why did I do it? Well, look, I've always written music and songs, uh, but privately, and I've never uh, uh, never foisted them on anybody. I've done some of them, you know, performed some of them in little jazz venues or little things like that. And um, uh, I have it's always been a companion to me, music and songwriting, and um, in private. But I suppose I reached the point where I had this story in my head, and I thought, well, I can't tell this any other way. And I've got some ideas and they started to formulate around the, 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 the book that I had in my head. And it was a particular story that, like I said, is semi-autobiographical that I felt lended itself or lent itself to um, my music. And I, I suddenly found that, that what I was writing um, helped me to tell the story that was in my head. So that's why I started to do it, because I thought, well, suddenly, I thought, well, this is making sense to me. So I continued with it. I had one song, and I realised, oh, actually, that's, 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 quite, that's quite good. I'm happy with that. Let's, let's put this to one side, and let's see if we can write something else which fits this part of the story. So I started with what I would call a song cycle which is around the, the, the book that was in my head that was still formulating. And then after I'd written uh, the songs and, and most of the libretto, I then went and said, well, now, how can I put these ideas, which are around the story that I wanted to tell, into book form? And that's how the book itself was, was written. So it's an unusual, uh, uh, I suppose, construction method. But um, I wanted to tell the story that was in my head. And that was the and has been and continues to be the um, major motivating force for me. Yeah. So essentially, it's a hobby which is turning out into something which could be something, maybe. And um, but you're not going to quit acting and suddenly try and be, you know, the next Lloyd Webber. This is something which is a, a as a. Um, this is something which you you choose to do from a. A personal pleasure point of view. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's also something that I believe will work on a professional professional stage. I have the experience to know that when I worked with the students at the Royal Academy of Music on my piece, that they were sufficiently excited by it mm. for me to realise that actually it does have an impact not just on them, mm. but on, on an audience. And it's, it's interesting to hear from an audience. So... Um, from the point of view of a piece of theatre, I know it works professionally. Mm. It can work professionally. I now have to get, I think, um, the themes of the music in a more um, solidified way. Mm. And I have to get, I probably need someone else to come in and help me with the book because mm. I don't think that's right yet. And I need someone to maybe do another treatment of it. But it's nice but that it's you a can work in progress. That. Yeah. yeah. No, I know that. And, yeah. and, and this is something that I've seen from, from the performance. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about you is that you're constantly busy. You, you've just come off stage with the ENO and then you're going on to another project which starts in, in next week or the week after mm. and there's another one after that. And I, I've never, never known you to not be busy, um, which means that you must be productive. And one of the things that um, I like to find out with people who I work with is what are the tips and tricks that make you ultra productive and how do you, how do you manage that in your life? Well, I, um, I've always tried to combine my musical ability with my acting ability. So uh, on several occasions, I've lied about being able to play an instrument uh, for an audition and then gone <laughs> naughty, away and learned naughty. something. Really? Yeah, oh. I have. Um, for instance, um, I learned to play the banjo for a part in the front page. And they said, can you play the banjo? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I can. <laughs> so, so I learned 
uh, over a period of about three or four weeks before I auditioned for it um, uh, to play something little on, on the banjo and I got the part and I also learnt the bass guitar for a part uh, that was a play called uh, Front Page and then there was another uh, part in a, um, a play called One Night Stand where I learnt the bass guitar because I I could play a little bit of acoustic guitar so I've used that and that's again that's kept me busy where I might have been out of work for a bit and then another on another occasion um, I, I played the acoustic guitar in a, in a play um, called The Amazing Dubru Angle Dodge and I, um, I've always, as I said before, played the piano from quite a young age. And I've used that in two separate productions. One more recently in, the, in a play called The Choir at the Glasgow Sits Theatre, where I was playing this, this choir master who played the piano and accompanied, uh, it was an actor kind of musician um, production. So that has helped me to um, give myself more uh, opportunities to work. Um, but at the same time, I also made a choice that... I was not going to just do musical theatre and I needed to turn down musical theatre because after Saigon, for instance, I got a lot of offers to do other big West End shows. And and, and after my experience on Phantom, Saigon, I realised that I could, if I wanted to, stay working musical theatre for a, a long time. But that's not what ultimately I wanted to, to do with my career. So I made a decision to turn down musical theatre work and just do work on a smaller scale. So I went to the Finborough um, and I went to the Gate and I went to the Bush. So you opened yourself up to lots of opportunities. and On and, a smaller and, scale. Yeah, sure. To try and learn more about my craft, yeah. learn more about the craft of acting yeah. so that I could be taken in, in a to come as more seriously yeah. as an actor rather than just someone who came from an but, I mean, you are so background. Bu- you are so busy though and when you when you do a run like like Man of the Manager at the Collie you're doing eight shows a week how do you how do you f- manage that how do you keep yourself on form um, you know do, do you do you meditate do you work out do you have a healthy food regime what 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 are the what's the physical or mental things that you do to keep yourself on form when you need to be on form for eight shows a week okay i tell you I, I, you have to have some discipline okay there's no no two ways around it i can't do what i used to do when i was in saigon and i used to have late nights and i used to go drinking and i used to do a lot of stuff i shouldn't have been doing and i and i was young but now i'm older i don't drink after a show too much I might have one drink I, I, I try to get to bed fairly early I make sure um, that um, I don't overtax my voice during the day I look after it and I do eat more healthily um, and I, 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 you have to really balance w- what you do during the day so that you're right for the evening so I'm constantly as soon as I wake up I'm gently warming the voice up during the course of the day I will drink a lot of liquid during the course of the day so that, that, that loads of you know warm tea and not 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 something that's too hot and so I'll, I'll get myself ready for the for the show that way um, and I, I, I think it your social life suffers when you're doing eight shows a yeah, week sure. and I'm and I'm prepared to take that on you know on the chin and not do the stuff that I used to do and just get myself ready and be you know my life revolves around the show. Um, and especially with something recently like Sancho Panza, which is a tough, it's a tough thing for any actor. Um, you can't be doing too much other stuff because mm. you'll just lose your voice. Mm. And so I really look after my voice, mm. um, and I make sure that. I mean, I would wear. I mean, it sounds crazy, but uh, during the rehearsal process, I would wear something around my throat to keep my my, my throat warm, and I would keep uh, you know a bottle of liquid with me all the way through the rehearsal process, and. Um, you know, you just have to really look after it and be careful. Mm. So that's the sort of thing that I do. I do. And I also, I do have a little routine before a show. And I, I say mantras. I do, um, and it's a private moment that I do for myself. And I don't want to talk about it too much, but it, it's something that, that ke- keeps me um, focused, that gets me focused. Um, and it, it starts about during the five for me. Um, and I'll do that for about five, ten minutes and then I'll be ready to do the show. Hmm. So that's a regular so that, thing. That, that's a form of meditation, actually, then, by it the is. sound of it. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things I find more and more is that when I'm speaking to people who are really at the top of their game, 
one of the things that seems to connect almost all of these people is that meditation comes into their life in some way, shape or form. I find that a really interesting thing. It's something which I've grappled with over the years and, and I've always found it very difficult to achieve and it's something which I would like very much to, to try and, well, I say try and find some time. I guess that's the, the, the stupid thing about meditation you, is that you always can find time. You but, make time. Yes, exactly. You don't have to find time, you just make time. Exactly. But and it's the, the, one key thing is that what you're doing is um you're telling the mind that this is this is this is about to focus me in a way that prepares me for what i'm about to do and there are very simple um early little meditation things that you can do that are very very easy to do and will only take five or ten minutes of your time and one of them is for instance for someone who's never meditated or has meditated very little is a breathing meditation and literally all you try and do is for about five or six minutes um, is just think about your breath and mm. nothing more. Mm. What will happen is um, you'll suddenly start wandering, your mind will wander. And as soon as the mind starts to wander and you notice it wandering, you just say, oh, well, let me think about my breath now. Yeah. And you come back to your breath. And if you try and discipline yourself after about a week or so, or maybe even longer, you'll start to just notice what the breath is doing mm. and the in and out of your breath and in through the nose or out through the mouth or in through the nose and out through the nose. Whatever way you choose to breathe is fine. And whatever and in whatever speed that you choose to breathe is fine, too. But you'll notice over time that the breathing becomes more and more interesting to you and that becomes more and more of a focus of what you mm. do. And that stills the mind. Because what it does do is it disconnects the mind from all the thoughts that are going on the whole time in your brain. Whilst we're talking together, you're thinking about a dozen other things yeah. probably that you're going to do later on today. You're thinking about how ill your cat is. Mm. You're thinking about is this going to you know, edit together properly. Mm. But all you're doing is you're getting rid of the extraneous thought and giving yourself a little bit of peace for five minutes. And that peace is a gold mine. Mm. It's a wonderful, wonderful gold mine that you can kind of just draw little nuggets out of and it will help you and, and you'll start to develop in other ways um, a kind of inner centre, a core of relaxation, which you need as an artist because it's such a, a, a demanding thing that we do. It really it, it, is. Yeah, for sure yeah. it is. And, and it's something which, as I say, I've been trying for, for years and I need to not try I need to do and that's definitely something which I'm going to think about over the next couple of days um, what's your prediction of where the entertainment industry will be in 20 years time and that could be whatever you want music theatre plays whatever you want yeah funny enough I did write something about that and um, I'd like to read this if I may sure so I think um, is there someone mowing their lawn there is <laughs> okay um, I think it's incredibly difficult to predict where the business will be in like 20 years' time. But I think with the advent of new technology, there will be more and more online productions. I think um, the influence of Netflix and Amazon on television and film can only increase. Smaller specialist channels like YouTube and, and you know, um, and Vimeo, is it called? Vimeo, Vimeo yeah. uh, where work uh, by emerging talent is produced. I think those will increase over the years. And I think what, what Netflix is doing right now is it's spending more money than anybody else on new production a new drama and new period stuff and it's very interesting how that's going to develop and I think where Amazon will be the same um, I think uh, even I think one or more uh, I think many more people were making films with their phones mm. um, you look at Steve Soderbergh who made a whole movie with his iPhone um, these methods of producing work will increase I think over the next 20 years theatre and plays and musicals will always have an audience they have done since the ancient Greeks and um, and I can see that um, I can't see that changing in, you know in any fundamental way there'll always be um, you know auditoria for, 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 for people to work in I think there's more scope for collaboration though I mean what you did particularly when you're working with people who come from a rock background and putting um, you know contemporary mu musicians together with people from the theater I think that's a very very positive um, you know uh, 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 advancement I mean look at what Bowie achieved in the last years of his life mm. with that wonderful thing um, and I think Sting produced some very interesting work as well for the theater and then Mark Knopfler's just written 20 new songs for his um, the remake of his film local hero yeah. so I think um, what's coming out of that for me seems to be and what happened at the National as well that with a light princess I can't remember was mm. it Vega um, who, who wrote, wrote music for that which was fascinating I think people coming from 
uh, uh, you know, uh, contemporary musicians and rock musicians or uh, any kind of musician that, that working with people from the theatre who are creative in a different way, but, but a, a kind of a um, symbiotic way, um, is very interesting. I think that's where I see it developing too as well. So, yeah. That's fascinating. Very well prepared answer. Um, this is a new thing that I'm going to try out on this podcast, and mm. it's uh, some quick fire questions. Oh yeah, go on. So I've got ten of them. You've not been prepped on this at all, no, so you no. have no idea uh, what I'm going to ask. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one: one person you've never worked with that you always wanted to. One person I've never worked with that I've always wanted to: probably Robert De Niro. Okay. <laughs> Number two: if you weren't an actor, what would you be? Uh, a teacher. A, a drama teacher or a, a, a generic teacher? Probably a, a, a teacher. I don't know what I teach, but... Um, Some form Maybe of languages. Okay. Number three. If you could have one thing in the world right now, what would it be? Your car. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Number four. What is the proudest moment of your career so far? Uh, the proudest moment of my career... Uh, it's probably when I got nominated. I know for um, for uh, for an Olivier uh, for uh, for Oslo. Well, that's a very special. Mm, thing. I hope it's not too big beheaded. But no, you no, you just be proud of that. It's a. I am achievement. proud of it. Yeah. Uh, number five. What's the worst moment of your career? Getting so far? sacked by Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> it's a good worst moment to have. Number six. What's the piece of music that you wish you would have written? Wow. Uh, probably uh, Brahms's uh, Third Symphony, the oh, one in E flat. Wow. Uh, I think it's that one. Super it's just choice. an extraordinary uh, piece of music. And number seven, what's a piece of music that you really can't stand? <sighs> you know, there's very little music that I absolutely abhor, but the, the thing that goes. I can't stand that song. There we go. <laughs> Um, what's that? What is that? Birdie song. That's yeah, what that's that be. for me okay. is cool. Okay, fine. Uh, number, uh, well, unfortunately though, it's an earworm and you will think about yes, that for the rest probably, of the day. I hope, I'm sorry it's to very the audience kind of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and number eight, uh, what's the instrument that you wish you could play? Oh, uh, I wish I could read the piano um, better than I, uh, I can. But if I, if I was honest, the bazooki. I'd love to have been able to play the really? bazooki. Yeah. And what about an instrument number nine or an instrument that you hate? An like, instrument I hate. You can't stand the sound of. I, I don't know whether there is an instrument that I hate. Um, and that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, a kazoo. There we go. And finally, number 10. Les Mis or Miss Saigon? Saigon. There we go. Um, Polly, I, I think, I mean, thank you so much for spending the time of doing this today. I didn't even get to my Victor Spinetti story. Well, what, what, go on. Tell me about your Victor Spinetti story. Go or on. my other one. Um, I'm not sure which one to tell because I wanted to say that he was a great inspiration to me. Um, We did a play called Comic Cuts together on tour and I used to drive him from one place to the other. And um, so I was his chauffeur and uh, I I used to listen to him talking in the car for hours on end. He had the most wonderful stories about uh, the Beatles who he worked with and, um, you know, all these fascinating people that were part of his his life. And he used to say to him, he said one thing which stayed in my my mind, he said, never be too in love with what you do because um, sometimes, you know, changes happen. So that's what he said, never be too in love with what you do because... I have found to my cost in, in working in new plays in particular when things are written and then suddenly the writer will have a different idea and that gets cut and you think oh I really like that I love that bit or a moment for instance when I was doing Les Mis in the preview stage where I had this fantastic section where I was climbing up and it never 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 made it to the uh, you know the actual um, ending of the, you know the, the completed show during previews, I had this fantastic sequence where I was pretending to be Jean Valjean with uh, Jean Valjean with a, with a, a, a dummy of Cosette on my back, being chased through the centre of Paris, climbing up, you know, forty feet up into the uh, the fly floor, and they're pretending to slip down, and everybody loved it, and, and it got cut. And again, that, you know, so never be too in love with what you do because I think you can y- y- your your ego will be damaged quite severely. So that was, that was one thing that Victor left me with. And another thing was that you never know. Uh, who it was, who it might be that you're talking to. Mm. So when you're talking to people and, and you know and you're having conversations about what you want to do and and what, where you want to be, then just be very careful about what you say. I remember before I was an actor, I used to work in this factory for a short time, making um, you know putting plastic bags on dresses, and um, I'd be having breakfast at quarter to eight in the morning. This guy, this 
fierce guy arrived um, practically bald with this walk right in the middle of his forehead and he'd arrive on a motorbike and he's sitting in to have his breakfast and we got into over a period of days got into having a conversation because he'd been at the same time as me and um, we maybe had breakfast together or a cup of tea together before I started work at eight o'clock anyway so these conversations would last about 10 minutes I remember telling him about my dream of becoming an actor and I hated working in this factory and I wanted to be an actor and my dream is to be, to be an actor and he said to me he said well you know what he said you know live your dream mate live your dreams and I, I said to him yeah well I'd like to and he said you know what so I've got a play coming out next week uh, it's down at, in the East End it's, uh, I said really I said yeah and I knew nothing about the theatre all I had was this dream in my head about being an actor so two years later, cut to two years later, I'm walking by a bus stop in Islington and I see this guy's face on a poster, massive great poster. And it's the guy that I've been talking to and I found out, you know who that was? Yeah. That was Stephen Burkoff. Oh my word, yes, of course. And then cut now to 30 years later, I'm very good friends with a guy called Gregory Gudgeon. And Gregory and I went to see a Burkoff's production of um, On the Waterfront at the Haymarket Theatre. And we went back afterwards to see the great man because Gregory had worked, worked with him and I um, was desperate to meet him because I'd never seen him from that day forward. I went back and he was in his dressing gown. It was very grand and he said hello to Greg and he was introduced to me. He didn't know me from Adam. And I looked at me, I looked at him, he looked at me I said to say, haven't I seen your face somewhere before? And I told him this story and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, and now look at you. He said, you become a very successful actor. You lived your dream. What a wonderful story. That's my story. And it's a true story and Gregory was there to witness it. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, what I find interesting about you, Polly, and, and you don't realise this because this is just inherently you, is that you've, you've got four bits of golden advice today. One, one is um, uh, to... Uh, what did you say from not love your work no, too much? Yeah, never be too in love with what you do. Yeah. Two is you never know who you're going to speak to, so try and respect everybody. Three is leave your ego at the door. And four is on top of all of that, uh, you have to go above and beyond what you need to do um, to to be satisfied. And, and having that self-criticism and that motivation is something which can make the difference between uh, a wonderful actor and a mediocre actor and in fact a wonderful musician a mediocre musician and you can apply that to almost anything in life and those are four bits of gems of advice and the interesting thing is that you've come today to to have this chat with me and you're sitting in front of your ipad you've got all of that stuff written out you've thought about it clearly concisely it's something which you didn't think oh do you know what? i'm just chatting with rob and we'll just make it up as we go along and that is just so stereotypical you and I think everybody can learn an awful lot from that. And if you are a young actor to listen to this or a young musician or anybody in any profession and you're trying to make it, you can apply those those rules to, to you. And I do believe that that will help you out enormously. And, and I hope that you continue to give that advice to everybody you meet. And you've certainly helped me out from that side. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Keep on giving it, keep on doing it. And I think you're a lovely man and it's a pleasure to know you. So, oh, thank you, Robert. Peter Pollock, thank, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again to my friend Polly. I think we all agree he's got an incredible take on life and is a real inspiration to all. Once again, I'd like to thank Lat56. They make my life easier when traveling by supplying me with the best luggage system on the market. And nope, I didn't get it for free. I paid 100% of the cost and was happy to do so. So from me, RDCE, ciao for now.